So lecture number one will be answering the question of what is tolerance given by Dr. David Haskell. He is an outspoken advocate of free expression and free thought with a PhD and an MA. And he's currently a professor at Wilfrid Laurier University, as well as running to be a member of parliament. And a round of applause. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I am delighted to be here at the University of Waterloo this evening. As you've been told, I'm a professor at Wilfrid Laurier University, and my experience at Laurier professionally and personally has influenced my understanding of tolerance. As a researcher, I've studied and I've published on the topic, and as a professor, I've been personally involved in campus debates about tolerance. In those debates, I and a handful of colleagues who think like me have argued that universities should tolerate, that is, they should allow, without coercion and without censorship, free thought and free expression. Unfortunately, a great many of our colleagues, particularly those who dominate a number of powerful campus committees, disagree. And it was actually this growing climate of intolerance toward ideas that convinced me to run for political office. I'm currently the standing nominee of the People's Party in Cambridge and North Dumfries, and I'll be running in the federal election this October. The People's Party is the newest politi political party, and one of our four values is respect. And what I've noticed, and what people in my party have noticed, is that in Canada it's becoming more and more impossible to disagree with each other and still respect each other. So the People's Party is focused on bringing back respect for people and for the diverse ideas that they hold. And I believe that getting to a place of respect begins with understanding what true intolerance and what true tolerance is. So that's going to be my mission tonight. We'll begin right now. First thing I need to accomplish is to tell you that tolerance does not equal acceptance. You see, a lot of people would suggest that we have to accept every idea or we're not tolerant and that is absolutely not the case. To have acceptance is to believe that a particular idea or behavior is just as worthwhile or legitimate as other competing ideas. Here's an example. I'm a meat eater. I have people in my family who are vegetarian. I accept those people. Here's why. I believe that their choice not to eat meat is as valid as my decision to be an omnivore to eat vegetables and meat. So in that way, I show acceptance. Now let's contrast that with tolerance. Tolerance is the inclination to allow something, to accommodate something, despite the fact that you find it objectionable. Tolerance is the willingness to put up with something that you do not wish to accept in your own life. Here's an example. I don't like smoking. I wish that no one smoked. If I could, I would probably forbid people from smoking. However, that would go too far for, for what I believe needs to happen in a tolerant society. So instead, I allow people to smoke as long as I'm able to avoid it. That's what tolerance is. To drive things home, let's take a look at this sentence. This comes from two Oxford, uh, Oxford scholars who are really the leading lights in this field, Clark and Powell, and they say that tolerance is only possible when some idea or practice is objectionable to us. It's when we don't like something that we can choose to be tolerant. We can hold our nose and choose to accommodate it. But what if you don't choose to be tolerant? That's a good question. What if you choose to be intolerant? What would that look like? Intolerance, when it takes place, involves the deliberate use of force or coercion to stop the action of another because you find it objectionable. Tolerance does not interfere, and intolerance interferes. And with intolerance, that interference can be exercised through physical force or political force. Let's go back to the smoking example. If I wanted to physically be intolerant, I could pull the cigarette out of your mouth. I could douse you with a pail of water. But maybe I didn't want to be charged criminally. So instead, I took a different tack, and I thought, I'm going to be politically intolerant. 
What I'll do is I will lobby government or become part of government and I'll create a policy that forbids smoking completely. Then we'd have political intolerance. It doesn't just have to be government, by the way, that can be politically intolerant. Universities can be intolerant too, and they can pass policies that are intolerant of others. Let me say one more thing about intolerance, and it's this. Sometimes intolerance is necessary. Now, you'd think that someone coming up to talk to you about having tolerance wouldn't say something like that, but we have to agree that there are cases when it's legitimate not to extend civil liberties to some groups and individuals. But when is that time? I wasn't smart enough to think of this on my own, so I'm going to tell you some of the philosophies of a fellow named John Stuart Mill. It comes from his work on liberty. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but in essence, Mill states that tolerance for someone's actions ends when physical harm to someone else begins. While actions that physically harm others are not allowed, Mill insists, and I agree, that tolerance for ideas and the expression of those ideas is almost always to be allowed. I say almost always because Mill and I will also make an exception. Statements that are clearly untrue or statements that make clear threats of physical harm shouldn't be tolerated either. But that's still a very high bar for tolerance. It's a high bar that certainly allows freedom of conscience and freedom of expression for objectionable ideas. And it's notable that Mill rejected the idea that exposure to ideas that offend does actual harm. And on that, by the way, the best psychological research shows that Mill is right. Ideas actually don't do harm. Okay, now we've done the easy stuff. I say it's the easy stuff because I've defined what tolerance is. I've defined what intolerance is. I've even gone so far as to say why we might want to be intolerant in those cases where there was physical threat or physical violence. We, we don't want to tolerate that. But I've done the, the easy thing. The hard part in any discussion of tolerance is trying to convince people who disagree with each other that despite their disagreements, tolerance is still the best option. So let me see if I can persuade you. In the contemporary West, it's been taken for granted when pure acceptance is not possible, tolerance should be extended to the ideas and actions that we find objectionable. And here's why. In the West, we value personal freedom above all other traits because we know that personal freedom and personal fulfillment are intertwined. The more personal freedom we can enjoy, the greater the likelihood of personal fulfillment. Slaves, whether they're in physical chains or mental chains, seldom achieve full personal fulfillment. As such, our freedom to believe what we want, our freedom to express our beliefs, and our freedom to behave in ways consistent with our beliefs have been made the cornerstone of our laws and the foundation of our culture. Keep in mind, in the West, Every right that previously oppressed minorities have gained was made possible because the thoughts and speech advocating for those rights was tolerated. Turning off the tap of tolerance because you don't want your ideological opponent to be allowed to speak is an incredibly dangerous precedent that will come back to haunt you. We have too many examples already of countries that have followed that model. Countries who think it's best to force the minds of their citizens into a stifling box of a single ideology. We don't have to look back in history for these examples. We have them today. We have countries where they are not tolerant of people who don't hold the same belief. We're diverging in your belief is punishable by death. Where loving the wrong person is punishable by death. Where a woman trying to exercise the rights that a man has in her country can be jailed, beaten, or punished by death. You see, tolerance is the secret ingredient in the successful recipe that is the West. 
by taking a live and let live attitude as often as ethically possible and by agreeing to disagree, we avoid a society that would be disagreeable for almost everyone. But sadly, the tide seems to have turned and our Canadian society, like most Western societies, is becoming ever more disagreeable especially when it comes to issues of sexuality, sexual identity, and gender. Tolerance is in short supply. Open discussion and debate on these topics is shouted down, censored, and forbidden. And here are some quick examples. About 90% of pro-life clubs on Canadian university campuses have experienced institutional censorship. Many are refused official standing by their student unions for holding views not aligned with the members of student council. In government, we have a sitting prime minister who prevented conservative Christians from receiving summer job funding because their views on when life begins didn't agree with his. In the media, an award-winning feminist blogger and journalist, Megan Murphy, had her work pulled down from the news site she was working for, Rabble.ca, and had her social media accounts frozen because she had made claims such as women menstruate and women aren't men, which were deemed transphobic by activists. Now, let's get back to campus just for one moment. In the last few years, some universities have drafted policies that on pain of expulsion forbid students from saying publicly that the marriage of a man and a woman is the foundation of a stable society. Why? Because such a statement, they say, the policymakers, it's heterosexist. And the irony in this situation is that it's primarily those on the social and political left, those who call themselves progressives, who are pushing us in this regressive, intolerant direction. And please don't think from the case studies I just gave that I'm cherry picking or that I'm simply making ad hominem attacks. The research on this growing intolerance on the left is clear and unequivocal. I'll start with some studies that examined intolerance on university campuses. In a recent study of protests on university campuses, uh, Dr. Sean Stevens, he's head of research at Heterodox Academy, determined that in the last 15 years, 90% of disruptions to keynote speakers were perpetrated by left and far left student groups against right-leaning speakers. In over a third of those cases, those left-leaning protesters use physical violence or threats. But if students are intolerant, it's likely they're learning it from their professors. I'll explain. Dr. Yoel Inbar, he's a professor at Tilburg University, recently surveyed professors of social science on North American campuses. After determining that 95% hold left or far left worldviews, he asked about their feelings toward colleagues who held conservative or right wing perspectives. Over a third of those liberal professors openly admitted that they would avoid hiring someone whom they knew had conservative views. About a quarter said they would purposely discriminate against research grants or publications if they came from people who they knew were conservative. And professors' intolerance is not reserved for just their conservative colleagues. It's applied to students as well. Sociologist George Yancey and Sam Reimer surveyed university professors across North America about their attitudes toward various student groups. A majority of professors admitted to being hostile to conservative Christian students, describing them as intolerant, unscientific enemies to be openly opposed. Openly opposing those you deem to be your unscientific enemies is not the kind of tolerance that you'd hope for from people who are marking your papers. Conservative Christians, by the way, were the only religious group to register anywhere near this level of negativity from their professors. All right, the research regarding leftist intolerance on campus is plentiful, but I want to squeeze just a few more in, a few more studies in that will more generally look at what's going on in our society at large. Uh, first of all, if you believe the reports of the mainstream media, 
you'd think that only one segment of society harbors prejudice, and that one segment are conservatives. But if you believed that, you'd be categorically wrong. In a study published just last year, Peter Dito and colleagues from the University of California did a meta-analysis of 51 other peer-reviewed journal articles, and what they found was this. After aggregating all of the data from those studies, they found that liberals are just as likely to show prejudice as conservatives. Of course, the only difference is that liberal bigotry is focused against conservative ideas and conservative people. Now, let me back up. I said that, that was the only difference. Actually, that's not correct. There is another major difference between liberals and conservatives, and it's demonstrated through other concurrent research. We also know that in total, liberals are more likely to act on their prejudice than conservatives. It might sound like I'm now repeating myself because I've already provided evidence of this intolerant trend among liberals on university campuses, but other research shows that off campus, in society at large, liberal prejudice is more likely to lead to acts of intolerance. And of course, conservatives will act on their prejudice, but it tends to be those on the far right of the political spectrum. It's a tiny fringe that other conservatives would actually condemn. But with liberals, acting on their prejudice is not limited to the fringes of the far left. Those we'd consider mainstream liberals, for example, professionals in academia, professional, professionals in media and government, are just as likely to imbibe the bitter waters of intolerance as those on their fringes. I could give you several examples, but I'll provide the one that's most memorable. In a, national, uh, rep a nationally representative survey, the Pew Research Center asked U.S. respondents to self-identify whether they were solidly liberal or solidly conservative. Those who said they were solidly liberal were actually the most solidly illiberal in their tolerance of others. About a quarter of the solidly liberal stated that they would stop talking to someone because of a difference in political view, while only 15% of conservatives said they'd have that reaction. There's also other research that shows that conservatives, when they hear a message about free expression, actually become more open-minded to the views of others, especially their political opponents. There's even more evidence that suggests conservatives are more willing to be ideologically diverse. I'm thinking now of some work that was done by John Haidt from New York University. He looked at, or I'm sorry, he surveyed a, a representative sample of Americans, some of them liberal, half of them liberal, half of them conservative, and asked, what do you think of these other people? What do you think of conservatives? Tell me how they think. Because what he wanted to see was, do you understand the views of the other side? The results were clear and consistent. Though they disagreed with the ideas of their political opposites, conservatives were able to say what liberals believed and why they believed it. Conservatives were able to put themselves in the liberal shoes and articulate issues from their perspective. Conversely, liberals were less likely to have that ability. And the more liberal they were, the less likely they were to understand the thoughts and motives of conservatives. And this gets us to the very heart of why tolerance is needed now more than ever, and why it's primarily those who call themselves liberals or progressives who have the most work to do. It seems that liberals today are allowing emotional reactions to come before rational actions. Interestingly, this is the same attitude that we see in fundamentalist religious believers. Both fundamentalist religious believers and liberals dedicated to political correctness and social justice are unwilling to consider arguments that contradict their sacred beliefs. But you can see the problem with that. If you don't listen to what other people have to say, you can never hope to understand them. And if you don't understand them, you're more likely to misinterpret their motives, and you're more likely to justify hating them. It's a truism that we're more likely to hate that which we don't understand. I began this speech by connecting tolerance to respect. 
And I'll close by finishing that thought. If we are to curb hate and enhance understanding, it's necessary that we extend respect to our fellow citizens, even those with whom we disagree. Respect means recognizing their humanity and treating them with compassion and civility. Of course, respecting someone's humanity does not require respecting all their ideas and beliefs, but it does require tolerating them. Thank you.